This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for Resolve dash masterclass. All right. All right. right. Hello, Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Good afternoon. Happens to fall after a Thursday. That's right. (laughs) And people get to see their favorite people two weeks in a row. No yeah. guests for the second time in a row. That's something we've yeah. ever done that before. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. There's it's a lot a, of uh, team presence the last few weeks. <clears throat> mm-hmm. We've we've got a we've got a, something that's so hot off the press it might even burn your fingers a little bit. <laughs> like literally ten minutes ago, fully yeah. approved. Yeah, yeah. It, we we thought about going out with the hey this we're gonna have this discussion maybe and it might be hot off the press. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It was we're gonna have a riffs maybe. <laughs> and uh, things will happen on that thing. And uh, anyway, I, I think it was kind of uh, it, it, yeah, interesting. La- we hear you. Man. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. We hear last, you, big guy. Yeah. Oof. Last night was uh, interesting too. So we have up and coming guests that are that are going to help us understand how power grids and electrons are formed, and how they how they worm their way across the grids, and how traders and power traders operate in that environment i think that's coming up in the next uh, few weeks so we were we were um sort of uh, pre-gaming that a little bit yesterday evening with these gentlemen and i am super excited about about that one not to put a little teaser in for some upcoming guests since we've been on a couple times in a row but uh when you think about you know what keeps your light on and your alarm clock going and your fridge going and and the intricacies of turning whether it's natural gas or um you know waterfalls into electrons and making sure that's reliably up you know 99.9 percent of the time wow that was that was fascinating but uh yeah no, and, and as per the one. usual yeah it's gonna be a good one um so we've got some really good guests coming up so just bear with us as you have to struggle through with the three of us on a, on a friday afternoon and always is a reminder uh, from a compliance perspective this isn't investment advice in this particular case we're actually reviewing a research paper that uh Adam has spearheaded and is literally hot off the press, just went to press. And if you're looking for it, you'll see it in the uh, YouTube channel right below. Um, Right there, there's uh, peering around corners, how to replicate trend following managed futures You can download it there. You can also download it on Twitter. We have it. We have it there. So it is literally hot, hot, like just released five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, maybe. Um, So we do realize you haven't had a chance to look at it. We'll be circling back with this. We've got uh, lots more conversations, but we thought, you know what, we'd kick it off with a little bit of discussion. And uh, as I said, not investment advice, you go get, do your own research, but uh, we're going to have a good far, far ranging conversation and dig into how you might think about uh, replication of uh, an index or a strategy like managed futures trend following, which is trickier than trickier than you might think. And there's some things that you have to think about in your prioritization and how you might create that thing. And I think Adam's done an absolutely spectacular job trying to think through that problem and convey it in very approachable terms. Yeah, just to to be also crystal clear here, um, Michael Harris asking, are we marketing a product? This is absolutely not a product discussion. This is the discussion of a research paper that explores you know, different methodologies that people might consider using for um, replicating really um, any strategy. And we just applied um, this in particular to uh, CTA, trend following CTAs. And um, there are maybe some unique features of trend following CTAs that um, might make it a little bit easier to reverse engineer the um, underlying holdings or exposures uh, of CTA managers in aggregate than certain other types of, of indices, which might hold um, a, a wide range of different products. And we may not know what the underlying products um, uh, might that they might be holding, right? Whereas with typically managed futures trend following, 
We've got a good sense of um, the general markets that these managers are trading on a regular basis, um, which gives us a real leg up. And we also have some decent intuition about the underlying strategies that they might employ, right? So those are two important tools that we bring to the analysis that um, sometimes we aren't able to bring to a replication analysis. So um, made it a little easier in this case. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it was a very interesting research cycle, and, uh, and and the paper was quite enlightening. Because what what you normally hear with uh, replication papers, or at least in the past, it has been about trying to identify the factors that are driving returns in other mutual funds and uh, and strategies, right? So, I mean, if we think back at the original papers that. Um, if I'm a French might have put out and uh, even AQR trying to replicate what Warren Buffett invests in, you know, that's just a way of peering through the data to see how well uh, or how it is that they can replicate the, the magic of Warren Buffett in a unique way. And I think that that paper was really interesting because it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was a levered portfolio of quality stocks 1.6 times or something to that effect, right? Yeah, right. there was, there, and there, was, was a, there was a quality exposure, and then there was some there was some inexpensive leverage that uh, Buffett is able to to employ by taking advantage of the insurance structure that um, he uses for investment purposes. Um, and yeah, the authors definitely demonstrated that you could, you know, ex post, right, giving Buffett sure. full credit for having recognized this decades ago, but um, in the decades since. Um, academics have identified certain factors that explain um, the variation in returns across different equity portfolios. And so AQ, the AQR paper was able to show that we could indeed explain the excess returns that, that Buffett has produced above just a cap weighted stock index um, by just generating exposures to a small set of different factors, right? Like value and quality and um and also adding some leverage right so that's an example of something called returns based style analysis which has been around since at least the early 90s and and probably long before and the idea there is to use linear models typically regression models to um you know identify the underlying exposures and in some cases the underlying holdings of mutual funds or hedge funds or what have you um, oftentimes it's used to, so for example, if you can, if you've got a, a mutual fund and you're evaluating whether the manager has skill, then you might run a returns based style analysis, trying to explain the returns of that mutual fund, um, using things like a long, short value, um, model or, uh, momentum or the market portfolio or, um, you know, different, different cap. Uh, capitalization stocks, small versus large, et cetera. And if you can explain the returns of that portfolio really well with those simple factor models, then, you know, some people might argue that that's not really the manager um, adding his own skill because an investor can simply allocate to passive indices that give exposure to those underlying factor strategies and replicate that manager's performance with very low fees, right? So they can sort of circumvent the need to allocate to the manager with the manager's higher um, fees for active management by simply allocating to a combination of um, other index funds that would otherwise replicate the performance of the manager, right? So the, the approach that we took in this case was um, at least partially informed by this returns-based style analysis approach. Yeah, but before we get into that, like just, oh, yeah. just you know, some of the, I think Alpha Architect has a portal where you can go in, drop in data series and uh, figure out how much of that manager has unique alpha versus can be explained by a series of factors that you can buy yourself. I think also from the, uh, is it Two Sigma that has another portal that you can sign up for and, and, and see, you know, what can be explained and if you find that it has many explanatory variables that are easily accessible and cheap, you might want to replicate it. And even if you're not perfect, you'll, you know, without the two and 20, you might be able to pull it off. Right. 
And then if you don't, if the, if the thing is that you try to put the data through, see if you can replicate it and you find that 80% of it is unexplainable, then, then that's how you kind of are able to know whether there's alpha there or not. Right. So it's, it's a, these are tools that are available now more than ever that have one, one of the key things here is what is alpha and what is beta these days. Right. It's an ever moving target that that uh, managers and allocators need to be aware of because they might be uh, paying more than what they need to. On, on that note, I, Rod, I think one of the one of the things that I really found fascinating in the journey along this paper was sort of the. I don't know, maybe everybody else knew it, but for me, it hit home that when you're replicating from a top down perspective and you're trying to pick up what the positions are, you're not necessarily concerned with how they're creating the positions, which allows you to be participating in the innovation under the surface that's going on with the various managers, mm. right? Whereas when you're creating from a bottom up perspective and you're saying, well, what are the general strategies that are used in this area and do an ensembling of those. So you're sort of capturing best areas and, you know, trying to get, you know, the maximize your, your, uh, um, signal to noise ratio. You're still not sure where the whole market itself lies with respect to its innovation on trend and how different managers might be doing very different things. And even though they're a small portion of the overall, group of managers, you're still picking up that innovation when you're top down. Whereas when you're bottom up, you're, you're responsible for that innovation. You're responsible for understanding those in the index and how they might be managing money and understanding the strategies they might be using. And so that was something to me that was a really interesting realization for me um, along, along this particular journey. Yeah, right. I think you're, we're, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, yeah, I, I'm probably. Yeah. It's a good yeah. teaser, a good teaser, yeah. though, um, for sure, right? Um, so do, I, we, we do begin the paper with a discussion of why someone might consider managed futures, um, you know, alongside a more traditional portfolio, right? So, uh, Rodrigo, I don't know if do you want to share sure. your screen. Do you want me to share my yeah, I'll screen? Yeah, share the screen. Or? I got it up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we just illustrate the performance of... Um, a global equity portfolio priced in U.S. dollars, a, a bond benchmark, um, the Barclays, I think it's now the Bloomberg aggregate, um, and the uh, Barclays B Top 50 CTA index. We we chose the B Top 50 because it just has the longest history of um, of hedge of CTA performance, right? So each year, Barclays going back to the 80s. Barclay selects the largest managers and um, puts them together into an index. Uh, they reconstitute that yearly based on you know changes in larger managers and uh, aggregate the performance of those managers. And, and so they, they report the performance of this index monthly going back to 1987. And um, it was neat to see, you know, obviously the blue line there is the B top 50 CTA index. The black line is the S and P 500. Uh, sorry, is Acqui sorry. rather is yeah. the um, MSCI index. All Cap World Index. So a global cap weighted <laughs> index proxy, and the yellow line is the Barclays Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index. Right. So what's interesting to see is that they all sort of end up in the same place uh, over what is that now uh, 35 years, and um, you know obviously since bonds got there with much less volatility, they had a much higher sharp ratio than, um, than equities. Um, the B top 50 CTA index has a sharp ratio kind of in between bonds and, and stocks. Uh, but they generally have a long-term average correlation that is, uh, about zero. Now we all know, right. From 2022 that the, uh, long-term average correlation doesn't mean much in terms of, you know, uh, day to day, month to month and year to year. We went through a very long period where stocks and bonds several decades anyways, where stocks and bonds effectively had a zero correlation and, and, and for the last decade, a negative correlation. And then along comes 2022 with a major inflationary impulse, all of a sudden stocks and bonds are reacting to the exact same macroeconomic variable, this inflation shock. Um, and so their correlations converge towards one, right? So they become very highly correlated. 
Now, fortunately, in the in the recent episode, the CTA index was actually negatively correlated to both stocks and bonds. Um, so in 2022, the CTAs in general acted as a really nice ballast for both stocks and bonds as stocks and bonds correlated and, and began to move in the same direction at the same time for a similar reason. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to just talk a little bit about the the like trend following as a concept. I mean, you, you just are showing three equity lines and they're different. This is amazing. <laughs> this is what we all look for, right? Things that make money over time, but do it with uh, taking a different path. You put them all together, you get a better result. But why is it that trend following managers have to have generally provided some much needed support in periods uh, when equities and bonds do poorly? Can anybody tell me that? We'll lay up for you guys. <laughs> the ability to go, the ability to go short. Well, okay, Mike. I'll, I'll, I'll take it if you need to, but the, I think the C? key, the C key plus. difference here, the key value of, um, of managed futures is that you're actually getting exposure to asset classes that are number one, super liquid across equities, bonds, commodities, currencies, rates, right? And you're able to, uh, short, right? So mm -hmm. what are the two blind spots that the 60, 40 portfolio, 50, 50 portfolio equities and bonds tend to have? Well, certainly anything that has equities dominating the allocation of the portfolio, like a 60-40, really has 90% of its risk embedded in it. And so the direction of your 60-40 portfolio will be largely dominated by whatever equities want to do, right? So if we go through a prolonged multi-year bear market, then that 60-40, 50-50 portfolio is going to be dragged down, right? What, can, what, what makes it a structural expectation for managed future strategies and trend to do it's well they're following trends so if the trends are negative and they are they are prolonged they're long enough to be able to capture them you should be able to structurally find non-correlation to that equity market and then what we've seen in 2022 is another structural reason why um you know having something like managed futures trend in your portfolio is that when inflation goes up and rates go up Right, you're able to, um, generally speaking, bonds will go down, and uh, equities will go down if, especially long duration equities like like growth <laughs> stocks, and you have the opportunity to short bonds and go long energies and inflationary regimes. So you just have access to to many more levers than you did before. And what's interesting today versus 20 years ago is that 20 years ago it was a very specialized group of individuals, very specialized group of custodians that would give access to a subset of asset classes with less liquidity. And it was seen as alpha, right? You need it, you need, it was a big lift to be able to provide this non-correlation. Today, fast forward 20 plus years, we really have turned this alpha, uh, you could say into something that's more, uh, more like a, a risk premia, right? Not necessarily a, an S&P 500 easily replicable, but it is getting closer and closer to something that the average investor and portfolio manager can actually create and replicate. And so it's starting to become more transparent. Uh, it's starting to become more accessible. There's more information out there than ever. We're starting to see the value of it. And I think it's one of these things that if you look through all the alternative options out there to, for you to think about replicating, you, what you really want is something that has a low correlation to both bonds and equities uh, and has an impact in periods when you need it to have an impact. And out of all the categories that we see, you know, uh, trend following systematic global macro tend to be the two that make that fit the foot, fit that bill. Right. So that's important. I think that was replicating a new beta is important. And at a time where people are more accepting of this particular strategy. Uh, so anyway, that was just a setup the idea of like why trend is an important thing uh, for portfolio construction in our view. I think it's worth also mentioning that, um, you know, the fact that we can effectively replicate um, a good portion of a strategy doesn't mean that there's no alpha, right? It doesn't mean that there's no skill. Um, there's absolutely not, not a doubt in my mind, um, knowing many of the managers of large CTA funds personally, um, having read their research, having spent the last uh, decade or more doing our own internal research on managed futures, um, there is an enormous 
um, amount of skill that goes into running a managed futures uh, portfolio. I think the whole idea here is that there is a, an element or there's a, there's a portion of those returns that are able to be systematically replicated. And that's what we're seeking to do here now, right? And um, if, you can, if you can replicate a good chunk of what's going on at those um, highly skilled CTA firms, uh, and you can do it with considerably lower fees than those firms charge, then maybe there's a fee alchemy. Uh, sorry, a fee alchemy. <laughs> Michael just posted alchemy there, but a fee yeah. alpha that, that can <laughs> be- totally, uh, He totally incepted you, that's hilarious. He did, like he totally. Too. Um, there's a fee alpha that might be able to be harvested. And I wanna talk a little bit about the idea of alpha and beta, right? Because you've sort of mentioned this a few times, yeah. uh, Rodrigo. And, um, you know, alpha and beta, they do have technical definitions, but I like to think about uh, alpha as really um, being very unique for every investor because, you know, what, what a large, sophisticated institution might perceive as alpha is probably different than what um, a typical retail investor might, might consider alpha, right? Alpha really is what you personally um, can't access cheaply and easily, right? Um, or in other words, beta is something that you can access cheaply and easily, right? Um, a sophisticated institution may be able to replicate or run a high quality uh, managed futures program internally and not need to outsource that to other external managers, right? So for them, managed futures is, is purely beta, um, but for a, a retail investor, you know, they may have difficulty accessing top managers. They definitely can't access top managers for very low fees. And so, you know, to whatever extent we can turn some portion of the skill that's being applied in managed futures funds uh, into a cheap beta and offer it for lower fees or one can, um, you know, then that's you know, that's a form of alpha that we can, uh, or not we, but one might be able to offer retail investors that they didn't have access to before. Yeah. The, and the I, other thing, oh, go ahead, Rod. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Well, just, it's, the other thing is you uh, think about the idea of, um, so I'm, I'm going to do some trend following in managed futures. Okay. So where should we start? Should we start with trying to pick a number of different managers where the dispersion in this area is very large, or it is quite different? Or should we start with trying to capture the main portion of what people are trying to do and then build around that with managers who we may be paying higher fees to in order for them to capture unique viewpoints on this trend? Or if you think, if your bias is, I actually want more short-term trend following. And the major indexes skew away from that. You know, the major sort of replication yeah. stuff when, when you'll read in the paper is that the shorter term side of the trend following is, you know, from the index's perspective, largely non-existent. And that, that, that may be for a few very good reasons that we could speculate on. Um, but so you, you want to, what is the core to this type of thing? And then where might I want to explore? What are my bias? Do I, I think is really long trend following? Do I think it's really short? Do I think I need a lot of mean reversion in my trend following? Like where, what are the things that I might want to add? Um, but you can have a core of this replication at a, at a lower fee. So it's not to say that, I don't think it's to say that you want to replace all of it. You still want to look for, as Adam alluded to, there's some really thoughtful cutting edge CTAs that are, you know, you're kind of looking for those edge cases where, yeah, I'm replicating the market and I'm going to get a lot of that innovation, but where do I think the innovation might be real and where would I want to yeah. place asset bets or exposures to capitalize on that and, and you know, see if I'm right to some degree, if said so, in that way. So, for example, we know a lot of people love Warren Buffett, love the way he chooses stocks and if, with a not long enough time frame, you'll be able to make some returns hopefully above the s p 500 right that's that's the whole point that's the whole jam he's got some structural uh components in there with the insurance policy what he can invest in how long he can invest in and what leverage he can utilize and so there's clearly some alpha there that people who have who can get access to it 
got access to it early and are able to do better than the S&P, you can. And, and institutions also search for managers with cutting edge all the time. They have a team that helps them do that and put things together, right? The average retail investor has largely decided that they're not good at that necessarily. So they buy passive indices, right? Instead of trying to pick a handful of really thoughtful SM, US equity managers across that whole spectrum, a lot of people have decided to just buy the S&P 500 at very cheap. So reduce the fees, get the, 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 the big muscle movement of the S&P and forget about the, the bells and whistles, right? In a similar way, trying to identify and trying to get access to the top CTA managers, they may not even and likely don't go to retail, right? And so, you know, what is the best way of doing an S&P 500-like index? You know, a way of doing that could be to, to replicate the BTOP 50, the, S, the SOC Gen Trend Index, the SOC Gen CTA Index, because it does it is representative largely of that kind of big muscle movement. And also, you know, if you're replicating that, you're going to get it at a level of risk that is common, you know, across all these managers and what they offer generally. Other bells and whistles you can add or take away, and as an institution, a lot of them prefer this, is they're looking for 20 to 25 volatility targeted CTAs, because when they put them together, that volatility could collapse and go way down, right? And so this is about giving the best for the most, right? Also, you, if you're going to be building something for the masses, you want to make sure that it's as liquid as possible. You're probably going to want to take away some of the um, smaller markets out there to ensure that you get that consistency and that liquidity across the board. So these are just things to contemplate and understand the difference between what you can do with the replication strategy. And when it, but if you do have the resources and you do want to go out there and find the best, you, more power to you. That's, that's a, a way of going about it, right? Can, Rodrigo, can, can maybe, you share a figure two? Yeah. Or is the figure two the violin chart? Yeah. Which is, yeah, because I want to do the, the I wanted a, a little dive on the, on the violin chart because I think it's, it's relevant to that point, Adam. And um, it's not a, it's not a, a particularly regular chart that people might see. So it might, might, might benefit from a little bit more explanation. Yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, the whole, the, the point here is too, that, you know, we talk about the CTA index, but the reality is you can't invest in, this is not an index you can invest in, right? Unless you go and buy all the managers in the index or buy units in the funds um, for, of all the managers in the index. So, um, you know, people typically gain access to the, don't, don't, uh, don't bring that up. That's not, that is false. I totally um, agree. I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> If like you guys um, like say like again, like we have to drink every like time. For those listening in, Jason Buck just put in for every like in the video, Resolve will reduce their fees by a bip. Um, so they beat, apparently they I was- They beat a zero. They beat a zero. Beat a zero. I was, so let's, been let's play on a that. drinking game. Let's play a drinking game and I'll drink if, if someone says like. Um, all right, trying to stay on course. The uh, You can invest in the index, right? So people typically buy a one or two or a bad, maybe a, a, a small basket of funds. Typically, you know, I think a retail investor would would just buy one maybe. Um, so that can be problematic because the what goes on under the hood for uh, any individual managed futures fund can mean that the return experience for that fund could deviate quite dramatically from the index and from all the other funds in the index um, over reasonably long periods of time. So, you know, what we're showing here, <clears throat> um, each of these yellow spl splurges here is a, <clears throat> illustrates the dispersion of individual managed futures mutual funds um, in each calendar year, right? So the one on the far left is 2018, then 2019. And um, so it just shows sort of, you know, the dispersion in the return experienced by all those different funds in that year. And you can see that, for example, in 2022, over on the far right, some managers in the, um, you know, of the, the mutual funds that we use that were representative, that we just drew from the um, Morningstar uh, managed futures category, um, actually had negative returns in 2022. And then there are other funds that delivered returns greater than 30%, right? So there's a very large dispersion. And you can see in each of the other years, there is still a fairly large dispersion. Um, 
on average is probably five or six percent per year, and that's on average. And if you just happen to get unlucky or, or lucky, that could be uh, you know very substantial, and that may compound over several years. So just choosing an individual fund. Um, may not be an optimal way to gain general exposure to the category, right? You may not, your, your experience may vary. And so this is sort of another motivation for um, if you want general exposure to manage futures as a concept, maybe allocating to something that, that tries to replicate the index may be a better alternative than trying to choose any individual fund. Yeah, and, and the other thing is the the style of the, the dispersion in the style and the approach in this space is quite large. And so you're also faced with the um, challenge of understanding, was it skill or was it just that this is the repetitive process that they use or process that they use, how, wherever you are in the world. Um, so short-term trend followers had a lot of trouble for a mm -hmm. long time. And, and maybe that's why we don't see a lot of that reflected in the index anymore because, you know, you go through a decade of um, really getting punched in the face and all of a sudden, you know, the area dries up and there's not too many professionals even practicing that type of thing anymore. And so yeah. was it their skill or was it that they were unlucky in this particular set of circumstances didn't manifest mm -hmm. in their favor for a decade? And then but what will happen over the coming decade? And so it's an interesting, you know, when you're thinking about trying to disentangle, you know, the features of somebody's sort of ethos or what they feel is in their domain of expertise and how they've <clears throat> determined that they would look at the lens of trend following. Is it just that that particular thing laid over top of a really opportune period of time? Or is it that they have skill and they actually are, are changing these types of environments? So it, it just to say that it's really hard to try and figure out who the best trend followers within the trend following space might be. And is it skill or is it a little bit of luck as we've had many discussions on previously? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the channel about lo the lost decade, which, um, you know, the managed futures category did have a, a, a rough period in the, um, in the, the 20 teens. And um, so, you know, the question is, well, you know, if, if a strategy can go through that kind of lost decade, then is it worth allocating to? So a, a few thoughts. Um, first of all, the S&P had a lost decade from 2000 until 2012 um, in in nominal terms and a little longer than that in real terms. Right. Um, the S&P has also had <laughs> um, very negative real returns through several other decades in the um, you know, over the last hundred or, or more. Um, bonds have also gone through very long 40, 45 year periods of, of, of real negative real returns. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> I don't think anyone's making the case that, that um, trend following managed futures are a panacea. I think we have often made the case that you want to have a core exposure to global equities, to global fixed income, to global commodities, to trend following managed futures, to other types of uh, global macro strategies and other diversifiers, if you can, you know, where, where you have faith and you can get access to them. Um, and yeah, we should absolutely, you should expect that each one of them are gonna go through um, lost decades. That's the nature yeah. of the game, right? The point is, I think this actually makes the case for us, right? So Michael Harris um, put in the chat that you know, there was a 2% per year, um, or there was a decade where the the Managed Futures Index compounded at 2% a year, which was slightly negative after inflation. At the same time, the S&P went up 11% a year. That's the point, right? That's why you want to own both Managed Futures and stocks and bonds in the portfolio, because you never know which one of them are going to go on to deliver the performance that you need over your investment horizon, right? And the more bets you have in the portfolio, the more likely you are to, to generate the returns that you need to support whatever your financial objectives are over your unique, personal, limited, finite investment horizon. Even if your horizon is, you know, several decades long, um, you know, uh, global equities have gone through multi-decade bear markets, um, especially in after inflation terms. So yeah, 
Diversification, yeah. man, get after it. And it's also it, like what I was looking at this table and table one in the paper and just observing you got from 1992 today, you got MSCI uh, at Barclays Ag and the BTOP 50, all roughly returning the same. And it's, you know, it's six. <clears throat> these are these are total returns, right? These aren't excess returns, Adam. Those are total returns. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they may seem a little anemic, right? Six, five, five percent. But the benefit, like with the, the, the whole concept that we've been talking about, a return stacking, you know, depending on what your risk tolerance is, if you're stacking six on top of five on top of five, if that's if you have a high risk tolerance. And remember, these are non-correlated uh, return streams. So it's not like you're, sta you're stacking those returns, but you will not necessarily be stacking the same amount of risk to the portfolio, right? The volatility will, will go up, but it won't necessarily go up by the same level as your return, your expected future return, right? So again, you go through a decade where after inflation trend does zero and the S&P does 11 and you're stacking one on top of the other, well, then you got your 11. Then you go through a decade like the 2000 to 2010 mm -hmm. period where the S&P does zero and trend does double digit. Well, now you stack double digit and then there's everything in between when they're both making money, right? So I think, again, it, 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 we're, I think a lot of times we have these discussions we're still stuck in this old paradigm of the canvas being 100%, where you have to give up some of the, your favorite things in order to get some of the diversification. I think today in today's environment and with the options available out there, you can do, you can have your cake and eat it too um, in terms of diversity and stacking. So something to consider there. That's also yeah. interesting that, that that period of time has one predominant direction of interest rates. Mm -hmm. So um, that would, you know, maybe, maybe that, well, I'm pretty sure that acts as a tailwind in the bond market, definitionally. <laughs> so, Sean. So, so that, yeah. that's something that might account for that slightly higher sharp ratio from bonds over that period of time. Well, God, yes. So, what do, what do we think about this comment from Sean? Non correlation of managed futures to bonds and stocks may not be inherent to managed futures, but in fact is selection bias. It's possible. I don't know, he's going to have to clarify. Um, I, I but, think I mean, maybe it, Sean, you can you can describe this, but I think what he's saying is, uh, we saw an equity line we liked, x x post, and then we put it in because we hope that it does the same in the future without really understanding what's underneath. Whereas I I think we can make a case, and I think I did earlier as to why it is an ex, it is likely a structural reality that managed futures will continue to provide conditional non correlation, right? Conditional non correlation. Um, well, do, Rod, do you mean trend managed futures or like? Yeah, we're talking about trend managed futures here, so I'm yeah. talking about trend managed futures. So yeah. specifically, you can you can you can create a an a, a base case for why the correlation needs to be there if you have the you have multiple time frames and look back periods for trend where you're going to be long and short these different things, right? So it may not give you a high level of confidence that there might be return there. Although we can make a case on that for that with regard to uh, Shannon's demon and rebalancing premium, and where that's maybe where the returns are coming from, regardless of whether trend provides positive outcomes. But one thing you can you can kind of intuit is that it will be the cor the correlation might it will is likely to continue or the lack of correlation is likely to continue over time. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have conviction that the low correlation exists. Our conviction doesn't come from the past history of low correlation. Our conviction mm -hmm. comes from the mechanics of how the markets are traded, right? Correct. First of all, there's, you know, probably over half the markets traded are not even related to stocks and bonds, right? They're, they're commodities and commodities in general have approximately zero long-term correlation to both stocks and bonds. So there's that. The other thing is they manage futures trade long and short without bias. So, you know, definitionally, they're going to be uncorrelated. It's not a, it's not, we're not suggesting that they're going to be negatively correlated. Um, there's going to be periods where they're going to be positively correlated. And then there's going to be other periods where they're going to be negatively correlated. And it'll be largely random, the times when they're positively and negatively correlated, which means, you know, you probably shouldn't try to time your allocation. But over time, structurally and mechanically, they're going to be uncorrelated just because of the way that they trade without bias, long and short. And yeah. because half but the it, markets are allocating to are uncorrelated stocks and bonds. 
it, it might be good to show the universe uh, from the paper. I, I, I maybe yeah. after your whatever point you're going to make here. Well, I'm just going to. Sh- this is just kind of showing the the condition because one of the things is correlation when we say correlation we're talking about the average right but mm-hmm. in reality the correlation of managed futures to bonds or managed futures to equities is like, like having your head in the freezer and your feet in the fire in the middle you have zero but you have moments of, of high and low and negative correlations this just shows kind of the trajectory of the soft gen trend index mm-hmm. against acqui and uh, bloomberg global aggregate bond index and you can see that it is by virtue of being a trend follower, uh, when the trends are strong and the upside, it'll be correlated to equities. When it's ne- when it's when the bonds are when the trends are negatively to the downside, it'll be negatively correlated, and that's kind of by design. So from the fundamental understanding of what it's doing underneath the hood, um, and w- and that's that's kind of also because a lot of times the other asset classes away from equities and bonds may be correlated to equities that are that you're long or you might be actually out of equities and might be long commodities but commodities happen to be correlated to equities and so back to mike's point what is it that managed futures trade in um i think the universe is here while you're pulling that up um i want to address the capacity issue that's been raised by sean wyland a couple times asserting that if too many people allocate to managed futures, then the edge will go away. Um, I, I want to echo Brian Moriarty's comment that that is true of every of every strategy, um, including market beta. Um, and also that there's absolutely no evidence that that's true, right? So that the total CTA category is about 150 billion after you net out um, Bridgewater, which is not a, a trend following strategy at all. Um, <clears throat> So it's 150 billion, and that hasn't really changed much. It doesn't change much. It you know went up by like a couple ten billion dollars after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, we haven't really seen much of a, a change in flows, despite its fantastic performance in 2022. The fact is, it's just uh, it's actually a hard um, sleeve to allocate to. It does go through you know multi year periods where it underperforms stocks. Most people have very uh, strong risk aversion of, to tracking error of, of domestic equity indices and just can't stand to not be participating in, in the stock market when all their buddies are participating in, in it and it seem to be getting rich around them. Um, it's just a really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to allocate to. So that, you know, from, from that perspective, there's a little bit of a risk premium um, built into it. Michael Harris asking if futures are zero sum. Um, yes, definitionally futures are zero sum. Um, so who's who's on the other side? Well, typically there's actually, I, I've been trying to find this, this paper, but the IMF put out a paper in 2011 that demonstrated that large institutions, they examined uh, insurance companies uh, public pensions, private pensions, endowments, and um, foundations. And what they discovered is that they typically chase performance, but at exactly the wrong time horizon. And they showed evidence that that may be a um, one of the, the contributors to why you know trends exist. And if you look at major institutions, if you look at, at, if it, at retail, at the money weighted returns of institutions and of uh, retail investments in, in mutual funds, et cetera, the money weighted returns show that most people are really bad timers. They chase returns over two or three year periods um, in both directions. And so, you know, they, they, over, they over chase after a period of strong performance and they over uh, sell during periods of poor performance. And that drives markets and the underlying, uh, drives strategies in the underlying markets and instruments that they hold to trend at different horizons, right? I mean, there's, there's lots a, of- There's also, there's also the outside forces, that, right? The, the whole idea of carry oh, yeah. and, and, and the, um, the way the term structure might be forming in the particular contract has a return to it. And that return is a return of preference and of all kinds of things like storage and whatnot and getting things through bottlenecks and getting things through things through periods of time or crop sessions mm-hmm. um, that are 
that outside of this system where it appears that there's two people that are on each side of every futures contract, that's true, but there are external forces where a producer of goods and a consumer of goods will want to have price certainty over a time frame, and they meet at a price which gives a risk premium to those speculators that are offering liquidity to that market. So in, it, whilst it appears to be zero sum inside the game, there is a broader outside of the game where that there's preferences that are not just tied to the actual price. There's actually, we could call yeah. them willing losers, but they're, they're just trying to hedge off some other thing that they've got on their balance sheet to worry about. And so they would rather price certainty and someone else is taking on that price uncertainty it's, in order to garner a, a return. So it's, it's not, like only it's not seeing, quite zero. It's not quite zero. Something. No, it's like, it's like only seeing one leg of the trade, right? If a hedger comes in and is willing to, even though they may believe that the, the market is going to go up in price, they need to reduce the volatility of their cash flows so that they can go out to the capital markets and raise a new IPO or go out to the bank and raise some some cash and they want to have that bank is going to want to have some certainty of cash flows. And so as an enterprise, we're seeing one leg of the trade where we're looking at them and maybe calling them willing losers. But in fact, they're winning and, and the, yes. the whole is greater than some of the parts. Right. So these are the elements that that kind of are explanatory variables as to why we've seen a positive outcome from speculating uh, and, and providing the other side of the, of the bet. Another interesting one that I really liked back in the day when we had uh, Chris Schindler in the podcast is the idea of queuing theory, right? Mike alluded yep. to bottlenecks as a thing. And he, you should listen to the podcast because you'll do a better job than I did. But the idea of queuing theory, which I think is an operations research kind of idea, is that you have a bunch of tellers that can take X amount of of customers at a set amount of time, right? Like they can stake one customer per minute. And can people, if, as long as people line up and one customer comes in per minute and, and they're able to clear those tellers easily, there is no issue. There is no, no, um, no bottlenecks. But the moment that you start randomizing which customer goes to which um, uh, cashier, you all of a sudden start getting these bottlenecks and start in the, in the think about commodities. Commodities don't clear easily, right? We have five long year, five long year cycles where, or more, depending on the commodity, where you know you might have demand and there's enough production in order to be able to satiate that demand. The demand dries up, people stop producing, and then it, it's these bottlenecks in queuing theory that may create, may make commodities in particular more susceptible to trending. Right. So these are think, all things that you guys can consider. think of oil being at negative. What was it? Thirty dollars. <laughs> in yeah, March yeah, of 2020 or whatever it was. That's yeah, because that's the they couldn't theory. get any more crude oil at Cushing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And that's the bottleneck and that's the problem. Yep. And so mm -hmm. then you get creative solutions on that of where that's going to go and and what the risk premium, what the cost is for that to go those other places and what people are willing to pay for it. In fact, there's a wonderful story as part of a, a hazing uh, when you come into, you know, um, a, a former colleague of ours told us this story about it, when you come into the futures trading desks in some of the high frequency uh, shops, what they will do is tell you that they've actually been assigned several hundred thousand head of cattle and it's been, it's being delivered. So you got to find a place for it to tell to teach them how you don't want to be assigned any of these contracts. And they run these juniors around to try and find places to put which by the way is literally impossible to do. And if it's possible, it's extremely expensive to do. And so they just want to emphasize that, you know, you don't want to get caught in these situations. It, it, we, we, we tricked you, it's fine. You don't have to find a place for, for 2000 head of cattle. But if you did, you now know the, the saliency of why you're going to want to close that contract before you take delivery. Yeah. Okay, let's shift yeah. away from the, the trend side, side of things and go back to the replication side of things. And maybe we can get into the nitty gritty of replication, Adam, and what's unique about replicating a fast moving trend strategy versus other things, for example, when we get into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we approached it from two directions, right? So by the way, we're not the first ones to, uh, to talk about hedge fund replication. Um, uh, obviously there was a product launched a, a couple of years ago that's been very successful and done a good job of tracking um, the CTA index. Um, 
And there have been plenty of papers written about hedge fund replication. There's a particularly good one by Lars Kessner um, on CTA replication. So, you know, we drew inspiration from the literature and from successful products as well. Um, I, my understanding is that um, the, some of the more successful products that, are, that do replicate the hedge fund index use what we term to be a top top down approach, right? So with the top down approach, um, you're sort of looking back over the last 20, 30, 40 days of returns of the underlying index, and you're using regression analysis, a robust regression analysis um, called ridge regression to or elastic net to um, figure out what combination of assets in a portfolio uh, if you were to hold those assets over that same period, would, would best track the returns of the underlying index, right? This is the same concept, exactly the same as returns-based style analysis, right? And by the way, there are more sophisticated ways to do this, right? You could use uh, uh, RNN, you could use a, a LSTM, long short term memory type uh, neural network model, which would account for the fact that, that the holdings auto-correlate through time, et cetera, et cetera. In the paper, we kept it pretty simple. <clears throat> we just used um, a, an ensemble of rolling regressions where, so for example, look back over the past 20 days, we've got a basket of instruments that we're gonna use to explain the movements of the underlying index. And then we're gonna try to create a portfolio that best mimics those movements, right? So it's called top down. So we just used a 20 day, 25 day, 30 day, 35 day and 40 day. Um, and then the question is, well, how do you weight the shorter term models versus the longer term models? And we just used a, a call it kind of a meta model where we regress the, um, the underlying tracking error between the, the different models and to find the, whether we want to weight, give, give the longer term models higher weight or the shorter term models higher weight at each individual point in time, right? So, and then we just took the, the weighted average of the weights that came out of each of those different models. And that became the sort of top down explanatory portfolio on that day for um, what is probably close to the underlying holdings in aggregate of managers in the, in the index. So this would be, again, going back to Buffett, just to keep it simple, this would be what, what the AQR approach would have been as to trying to identify the weights and then replicate it. It's a little time. different, I think, because I think that the Buffett one is a little closer to the, um, is a little closer to the bottom up, I think, right? Because the idea is you're trying to exp use the same process to oh, select stock that, okay. that Buffett used, right? Um, whereas in this case, we're literally just trying to, to figure out what are the underlying holdings, right? So this has some benefits, right? As Mike mentioned earlier, the benefit of this type of top-down replication is that um, if you don't have a good understanding of the likely methods that the underlying managers are using to inform their, what goes into the portfolios, then you could just, you know, you could just see or try to look through to approximate what their holdings are uh, through time, right? Um, and therefore, you're going to be able to take advantage of any innovation, as Mike mentioned, that might be going on in the space, right? These keep in mind, these trend following managers, have, many of them have been around for decades, they're constantly innovating. And so this top down method may allow for the potential to, to better take advantage of some of those innovations through time. On the downside, um, you know, you're trying to mimic what's in the portfolio over the last kind of 20 to 40 days, um, a regression analysis, even robust regression analyses, uh, can come up with relatively noisy approximations when the number of observations you're using to fit the model is relatively small number relative to the number of variables. So for example, even in our small universe that we're gonna, so we should probably go through the universe. Yeah, let's go through the universe. And, yeah. yeah. Maybe actually just, can you pull up the universe? Yep. Um, Thing again. So for the top-down um, modeling process, we use both a small universe, which is nine markets, and a larger universe, which is uh, 20, 27 markets. And 
you can see, although it's not super clear in this image, but you can see that the small universe is a subset of the larger universe and the holdings in the small universe are have a red square around them. Um, so for example, F, V, T, Y, T, U, U, S. Yeah, if you zoom in, you can see, right? So there's nine markets. It's just meant to be sort of a, a small representative basket. You've got some bonds, you've got some equity markets, you've got uh, oil, CL, um, you've got gold, right? And that's pretty well, you've got a couple of currencies, Euro and, and Yen, and that's pretty well it. Whereas the medium sized universe, we just add more markets in each of the different categories, right? For the purpose of, of, of you know, creating an index that can be easily scaled to many hundreds or, or of millions or even billions of dollars, we left out any illiquid markets where investors might face some constraints in terms of CFTC limits, et cetera, right? So for the top-down approach, we ran this, you know, rolling regression, trying to approximate the holdings of the CTA index using both the small index and the medium sized index of, of markets. And, you know, be, for the reasons I discussed, you've got nine markets that you're using to explain returns over 20, 30, 40 days. Um, you, that regression is going to be noisy. The models are going to be noisy, even, even with the regularization techniques that we use. And so, um, you know, that is definitely a downside of, of top down models. And also what's interesting to see is that the, maybe just go on to the next one, if you don't mind, uh, is that the top down model and the bottom up, sorry, the top down small universe model and the top down medium sized universe model had slightly different return trajectories, right? They're reasonably highly correlated, correlation of, of about 0.7 between them, but they outperform and underperform and track the index and are, relatively better or worse way at different points in time, right? So what's great about that is that you can combine them and get sort of the best of both worlds there. And so you know, this is what you see. The yellow line is the top down medium universe. The black line is the top down small universe. And then the blue line obviously is a, is a combination of the two, right? They all kind of meet at the same, in the same place. The combination does a little bit better on a risk adjusted returns basis because um, you're getting the, the diversification benefits between the two types of models. Um, and the, the combination strategy also tracks the underlying uh, SOC Gen trend index uh, a bit more closely than either of them on its own, right? So a perfectly reasonable approach to use. My understanding is that this is a, this is a closer approximation to what some of the more popular CTA tracking um, ETFs use under the hood um and it does reasonably well right but it's not the only way to go yeah and what is so let's talk about the pros of of that once again i just want to just to summarize i know we've already uh, addressed them so what are the pros of an approach like this from a replication perspective the pros are that you are you know directly trying to mimic what's going on in the underlying manager portfolios so you need to make fewer assumptions about the strategies that the managers are employing in order to create the portfolios, right? You're literally just trying to mimic what they're doing. You're not making any assumptions. You're making some assumptions about the markets that they're probably trading within them, right? But we know in general that most CTAs try to trade a, across a broad basket of, of, of markets, a bunch of equity indices, bond indices, commodities, currencies, some of them trade more exotic industries, calendar spreads, et cetera. But sort of broadly, that is a representative basket of, of the exposures that these uh, most of the managers are employing, right? Um, the drawbacks of using this kind of approach are that you may be out of sync in terms of your modeling with changes in the portfolio if they're happening relatively quickly. Um, so, you know, we're looking at the performance of the portfolio over the last... 20 to 40 days, there's obviously a lag between our models and what our models are representing that the underlying funds are holding and the changes that might be going on within the underlying funds based on their you know, in, unique mechanics that they're using to, right. to drive their portfolio selection, right? So 
pros and cons that the bottom up method can fill in some of the gaps on. And so there's a, the, the, the detraction is that it might be a little delayed. Now, how often in the paper are you refreshing the portfolio or rebalancing the portfolio? Every day. So this is a daily rebalance, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. So that's top down approach. Now the, let's, let's get into the bottom up approach and why that was a, a separate useful tool. Yeah, sounds good. So the great thing about managed futures is that we have a general uh, intuition about the strategies, the general strategies that people are using, that these managers use to identify trends, right? Um, some managers use moving averages, moving, moving average cross, double moving average cross, breakout strategies, et cetera. Um, it may seem like these strategies would be would produce very different profiles in reality they overlap by quite a bit you know shorter term breakout strategies have a lot in common with shorter term time series momentum strategies and certain types of moving average strategies and double moving average strategies etc um and we can see that as we sort of uh, look through the results of our bottom-up analysis but the idea here is we have a general intuition they're using you know past returns overlook back horizon somewhere in the neighborhood of call it 20 to 300 days to um, inform whether a market is in an uptrend or a downtrend, right? So if the past 20 day returns were positive, then, you know, the shorter term trend portion of the manager strategy would obviously be looking to, to, to hold a long position in that market and vice versa for negative returns and short positions, right? So, but what we don't know is what markets are they trading and in what proportion, right? And what strategies are they employing? Are they, are they skewing towards shorter term strategies or are they skewing towards longer term strategies, right? So what we do is we take a representative basket of all of these different markets, the 27 markets in our medium universe, and we run simple trend following strategies on each of the markets independently, right? So we're running a short-term um, trend strategy on oil futures, a short-term trend strategy on S&P futures, et cetera, et cetera, right? Medium-term trend, trend strategy on oil futures, medium-term on, on, on uh, equity futures, across all the different futures markets and across a wide variety of different trend length specifications from about 20 days up to about 250, 300 days, right? And then we use, again, ridge regression or robust regression in order to identify the, um, the markets, the market strategy combination that best explains the returns of the managed futures index, right? Maybe you can put up, I think it's figure three, Rodrigo, because um, I think it's interesting to dig into the, specifically the, the trend lengths this so one. how the trend lengths were emphasized. There we go. Where the trend lengths were um, were emphasized. So, you know, obviously um, the managers in the CTA trend index, they don't really trade short-term trends, right? We did allude to this earlier. Typically they skew towards <clears throat> longer-term trends. In fact, about, I think 95% of the weight um, across all these different strategies went to strategies with greater than 90 day lookbacks, right? So, you can see yeah, this, this in the is, chart. This is figure seven for those listening. I want to follow along later, so not figure three. Yeah, which makes me think that maybe the, the numbering may be off in the figures. Anyways, um, uh, but this, this figure shows that the 260 day you know, return is most widely used by trend followers across all the different markets, right? Some people might also be wondering what markets were, were chosen. And it turns out that all, all of our 27 markets across equity, mar equity indices, bond indices, commodities, and currencies uh, were selected for inclusion, though some of them, you know, received more weight than others, and some of them received um, different weightings in terms of what trend 
length exposures were allocated to within the model, right? But, you know, I think this is consistent with our intuition that most of the managers in the trend index, large managers, tend to trade based on longer term trends uh, for a few reasons, um, one of which is liquidity, right? Um, longer term trends just incur a lot. You're not trading nearly as much, right? So you're incurring less trading, trading costs and you're also not um, incurring a lot of trade frictions as you um, as you're as you're going in and out of positions. So, you know, just in general, as you listen to trend big trend following managers describe their process, most of them will typically say we allocate to sort of intermediate to long term trends, and we do observe that in the data. Yeah, yeah and, and I think there's a liquidity issue there too, go, spreading the the bets across multiple contracts. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. at quarters because it's it's you do run into. Uh, a challenge with respect to capacity if you're yeah. just trading the front month. So you, and, and if you're shorter term, it becomes harder. And short term managers exist out there and they have their place and they don't take a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. They, they provide their alpha for a small group of investors and then that's it, right? So it's just not, again, broadly something you can make broadly available to, um, to no, precisely yeah. it's, it's, it's really tough to index that or bring that to a, the the masses in a cheap way all right so yeah. so in, in contrast to top down now we we just described bottom up um what are the pros of bottom up in contrast to top down so the bottom up um empirically tracks the index better than the than the top down um it also has lower turnover than than the top down and it has just better long-term performance as well um so, but, you know, we're making some assumptions, right? So the drawback here is that we're, we're making an assumption about the underlying processes that managed futures managers are using to identify trends. And if the processes that we're bringing to the table to model the returns don't overlap to a meaningful extent with the um, strategies that are used in aggregate by the underlying funds, then, you know, we, we could be in error, we, there, there could be some more dispersion between um, you know, what we hold in the replication portfolio and what the actual managers are holding in the index, right? Yeah, so in the one case you're getting, the top down allows you to evolve faster as, as the managers are evolving their strategies and their trend lengths and the, and the like. So if the goal here is to replicate that index, you will be cl closer to that. Whereas the bottom up approach is you know, it'll take a little while longer to reassess and remine the new types of strategies that might they might be deploying. So a little bit less um, agile in terms of innovation, but likely more agile if things don't largely change too much, right? More agile in that you are getting in and out of markets as they trigger in contrast yeah. to looking back, having a bit of a lag and using the performance in order to inform whether it should be long or short. Yeah. yeah. So actually, we did we did some experiments that I think it is worth discussing, and I guess that would be Figure Eight, Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, so the question is, you know, first of all, does our modeling work? Is that Figure Eight? No. Then That's it's the one eight, before so. that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that. Oh, okay. Go up one more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So. Um, it's, it's great to say, you know, we could look at all the returns of the uh, long-term returns of the CTA index all the way to, to two, back to 2000 and say, well, yeah, we can, we can model the underlying strategies and markets that go into that index relatively well. But the question is, does, will that work at well out of sample, right? So what we did to test that is we, we used something called K-fold cross-validation, which is a very common technique in data science where you take 90% of the data and you fit a model. So in this case, we're going to try and replicate the, CT, the SG trend index using our, our market strategy pairs as explanatory variables. Uh, over 90% of the um, term of the underlying index. And then we're going to generate the weights that we should allocate to those market strategy pairs 
And then we're going to apply those weights to the 10% of the data that the models were not fit on, right? And see how they do, right? So is the exposures that we're identifying that, that drive the portfolio changes in the SG trend index uh, in one period, do they persist in another period, right? Are they relatively stable through time? So what we did here, the blue line here is actually where we, you know, took the first 90%, used the fit, applied it to the final 10%. And then we took the final 90%, made a fit, applied it to the first 10%. And so we did, we divided it up like that in the 10 different sections. And then we just stitched together all of the out of sample results. That's the blue line. The yellow line is if we just did a full fit on the entire sample from 2000 and um, you know, saw how that explained the, the underlying models. And you can see by virtue of the fact that the dark blue line and the yellow line overlap each other almost perfectly, they have a correlation of, of over 0.99, that the, the styles or the strategies and markets that are identified by this underlying process are highly stable and consistent through time. Yeah. And um, so that gives a, you confidence to be able to use the full series um, as the, you know, to, to model the underlying processes using the full series. And that, that those underlying models are likely to go on and perform similarly well in tracking the index in the future. Yeah, and just uh, Mike has, has said something that, is very interesting that that outlier in 2014 looks interesting, 2014, 2015. That was due largely to a 75% collapse in the energy markets and the commodity markets uh, in that period. If you look at that, that is a clear, yeah. defined trend that lasted long and went for 75%. Rare, rare events. But that's, that's the advantage of having that, you know, the ability to trend follow commodities when you have a bond and equity portfolio, right? Well, I think that's the whole the whole point is you it's it's kind of going to be like lightning. Yeah, <laughs> there are going to be very. This is why trying to time the allocation um, from the perspective of picking it uh, with trying to think that something's going to happen is tricky. Um, you have to kind of have the allocation for when the thing that creates the opportunity happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I I, I like to to some extent how some of the trend followers like Jerry Parker describe trend following as outlier hunting, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, w w you're really looking for these, these extremely large persistent moves that, that you have no idea which market's gonna happen to, you don't have no idea when, but we do know that, that uh, market returns are highly non-normal. They're highly leptocurtic. Many of them are highly skewed. And so trend following is able to pick up on some of those major outlier moves and you know that's what makes those big outlier cut, years for some of cut them. your losses ride your winners yeah no. yeah as 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 trite as that is it is the waiting for those lottos or as, as mike says the lottos or those outlier events to occur capitalizing on them and then waiting for the next one yeah you know, people often talk about the smile characteristic of a managed future strategy right where you get a lot of observations and a lot of data points and performance that are in like the low returns, you know, right in the middle. But then you have whenever there is an extreme positive or negative event, there's convexity to the strategy that provides that diversity. So that again, yeah. structural, we've seen it, we can explain it, we can understand it. And, and that gives us confidence that it's likely to be uh, there in the future. All right, exactly. So we've, yeah, we we've tried to um, the whole point of this paper is to identify <clears throat> interesting ways. And I know, you know, you and Andrew Butler, um, the um, CIO in Resolve Canada worked really hard to kind of use the right techniques and put them together in a way that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so what, uh, what is the, the best approach here from a Resolve perspective? We pick one over the other? Yeah, so I mean, as, as usual, at least for the purpose of the paper, um, we just decided to, to, to give 50% of the weight to the top-down approach and 50% to the bottom-up because they complement one another's strengths and weaknesses, right? The 
uh, bottom up one suffers from the fact that we may not have a totally representative set of strategies um, to explain the returns of the underlying index. Um, but it is a, a lot more consistent over time. It does a better job of tracking the index and um, has overall better performance and a lot less turnover. The, the top down has the benefit of being able to react to whatever underlying innovations are happening in the funds because we're just looking through and trying to capture the holdings of the funds from day to day. Um, but we also may be wildly out of sync from time to time with portfolio holdings because there's a lag between the, the period that we're assessing the fit over and what may be happening in the underlying portfolios um, from time to time. So it's, um, I think they're just nicely complementary from a theoretical standpoint and empirically when you put them together they, they just do a, a better job of tracking the index and they have demonstrated um, better long-term performance. Maybe you can put that up, Rodrigo. Yep. yep, looking for it. Yeah, so that's figure eight. That's the one you're looking for, right? Yep, yep, that's the one, yeah. Um, so, what, so this, this requires is a, some explanation. Yeah, the, the top two, um, so first of all, this is all excess returns. OK, um, for future strategies, you deposit some margin and it, you, you're able to get a lot of exposure for um, having very few dollars um, available to you. Right. So <clears throat> what I didn't do here is include collateral yields. So typically with managed futures, you post collateral at a an FCM like a, a futures trader um, and then you know you use that collateral which is relatively small relative to the size of the actual exposures you're getting um you'll typically get a yield on that collateral so they'll invest that collateral um they'll give you some probably a discount on t-bills or whatever but then there's a huge amount of cash you know 50 to 70 percent of the portfolio is just held in cash and that cash obviously can be held in t-bills or high interest savings accounts or other types of strategies to generate a yield on it. So what I'm showing here for all of these different strategies is just the excess returns. So the excess returns in excess of cash. So um, we did the same thing for the SG trend index in blue. That SG trend index is the performance of the trend index in excess of what you would have gotten from investing in cash. All right. So that all of the lines are apples to apples for comparison purposes. Okay. The light blue line at the top is the combo, the 50-50 combo replication strategy net of our estimated fees, uh, sorry, commissions and slippage, but no fees. All right. Now we do make the case that very few people will be able to run this strategy on their own with no fees. They'll probably have to allocate to some kind of product or something in order to get exposure to it. So we just took you know, a 1% fee as maybe a standard fee for other types of funds like this in that are out there. Um, and so the black line is the replication strategy net of expected slippage and commissions and net of a 1% fee. The blue line is the, you know, excess return trajectory for the SG trend index. The dark blue. One line. of the complications here is that the index itself is a combination of funds. Each of those funds charge a slightly different fee and they almost all charge performance fees. The performance fees are charged typically after they reach a high watermark. Different funds are gonna reach high watermarks at different times. Different investors who invested in those funds are gonna hit high watermarks at different times. And so we're not, it's not like you can just run a two and 20 overlay on the net replication strategy and, and, and basically get the same returns as the, um, as the underlying index, <clears throat> because all of the underlying funds have charged their own performance fees at very different times along the way. So in order to illustrate how well the strategy tracks the underlying index, we just ran 
the replication strategy, but where we set the sharp ratio of the replication strategy to be equal to the sharp ratio of the of the SG trend index over all rolling three year periods, right? So it's really the yellow line there is really just to illustrate how well the strategy mimics the character of the SG trend index. It is not meant to sort of illustrate any sort of performance expectations. Yeah. Is that no, clear? Or did important. you guys want to? No, that, that, yeah. that was clear. It really Nailed is it. about, I think we were talking about this internally when you, sh when you don't include a fee, it just seems like it's really tough to tell how, how well we did, right, with this, okay. with this experiment. It's just a, a matter of, okay, how do we get the results that we got and, uh, and be able to visually show that indeed we are doing a pretty good job using these techniques of replicating the, the index that we want. It's, it's all it is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So maybe just scroll down to the performance table. <clears throat> So first of all, remember the goal here is to track the index, right? So, you know, re in reality, the, the actual performance is less important than how well the strategy correlates to the SG trend index, right? So you can see, in fact, that we get a correlation of about 0.86, which is pretty high. Um, the If you look at the live correlation for some of the other uh, replication ETFs, their correlation is quite a bit lower than that, right? And in fact, what we do observe, I don't discuss this in the paper, but I can just discuss it live here, is that the correlation of the replication strategy has actually been higher in the recent period than in, in the uh, distant past period. Um, so in fact, our tracking seems to get a little bit better over time, at least empirically in what we're able to observe. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that the majority of the improvement in annualized returns that we see, right? The difference between sort of eight, nine percent excess returns versus just shy of five percent excess returns for the SG trend index is mostly just that fee delta, right? There's no performance fees. Um, and you know, even a one percent fee is lower than the typical two percent management fee that that most uh futures funds charge. So, you know, that gap there, the call it three percent gap, is approximately the fee alpha that you might be able to potentially capture um, if you were to allocate to this in a low fee tracking uh, structure instead of allocating to a basket of funds that are all charging two and 20 performance fees. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically it on the paper. Um, the link is included in the top of the chat and it's included in the in the show notes in YouTube and in your favorite podcast listener. You can also always go to investorsall.com to download it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope it was educational, useful, made you think about the concept of replication in a unique way. Is there anything else that we didn't cover, Mike, Adam, that we think we need to cover here? No, I'm, I'm well, someone asked the, about the impact of slippage and commissions. I want to say that that was a little sure. over 1%, about 1.5% 1 um, was what came out because of commissions and, and, uh, and, tr and slippage uh, esti estimates. Yeah, and if you really want to get your hands dirty at the end of the paper, there's an appendix that goes into the different regression approaches that were taken and, um, and get into more nitty gritty detail there. Yeah, and I would say, yeah, we're welcome for more feedback. This was, as, I, as we mentioned at the outset, is hot, hot, hot off the press. And yeah. so we're looking forward to more feedback and uh, more discussions on the paper uh, to, to dig into the areas where people might be unclear, want more details, um, and those types of things. So it, it is uh, launch day one, I guess, as it were. Yes. Do reach That's out. That's right. Yeah. Do ask questions. Um, please like and share. Um, you know, sh share the paper yeah. around if you find it useful. Um, please hit the like button on this uh, podcast. Please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Um, yeah. And thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Cue the music. This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global 
Explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for Resolve Dash Masterclass.